Hi, and welcome to Talk Straight Bible. I'm your host, Jeremiah Zantanetti, and on today's message, from the Word of God, as always, we're bringing you back to Romans chapter 8. We've been swimming in Romans chapter 8 for a little bit. As a matter of fact, this is the 24th part. And you know, there's so much in this chapter. Like I said, it seems to be the stem in the middle between the whole book of Romans from 1 to 7, and then from 9 to 16. And there's so much in this book. As a matter of fact, whenever people, most people in churches, they give out the Bible. If they don't give the whole Bible, they give a part of the Bible, John and Romans. They work together perfectly because this is what it's all about. We get saved, but then we come into the understanding of the righteousness of God in us, that we've been justified by faith. Oh, and that faith, my brothers and my sisters, is not ours. It belongs to the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm reminded of Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. And Paul tells us that he was crucified with Christ. And he no longer lives, but Christ lives in him. Think about that. He understood that. And he said that the life I live now in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave his life for me. See, here we see John 3.16 in full swing. The whole power of John 3.16 that God offered his Son to die for us so that we can have eternal life and not perish. So now, here we are in chapter 8 of Romans where Paul gives us a tremendous theological discussion about about being in Christ and having no condemnation. But he teaches us also in this letter at the very end, which we're going to get to eventually, that we are more than conquerors through Christ. So here we are from yesterday, we were talking about the sufferings that we go through in this world, the trials and the tribulations. Everything that we go through is for a purpose, that God subjected us to suffer. And you say, why would God do that? I wouldn't put my children to suffer. Well, you see, when you look at it from a perspective of a parent, no, we do not want to put our children to suffer. But the things that we teach them is so that they do not have to suffer, but we know they're going to suffer. And there are times you have to put them through a test. Sometimes you have to withhold things from them and let them learn how to deal with it. You say, why do you do that? So that they can learn how to depend, not on their own power, but on the power of God. And so the whole creation, I'm talking about the earth, I'm talking about us, we are subject to suffering, but our suffering is not in vain because we know that the expectation of our faith is Christ. Oh, my brothers and my sisters, but on that day when he shows himself, when he comes through the eastern sky, when he breaks through it, And he comes with the trumpet of his call. The trumpet that will tell us it's time to come up to him. Oh man, that's going to be awesome. Everything we have gone through in this earth, everything that we've been through in trials and tribulations, afflictions, you name it, will suddenly fall off of us and we will be triumphantly meeting him in the air. Oh man, I don't know about you, but that day, is so, so wonderful. And I'm looking forward to breaking off of the bondage of this world, this corruption, and coming to the glorious liberty of the children of God. And in verse 22, it tells us, for we know that the whole creation groans and travails in pain together until now. I I keep going back. I'm reminded of Israel, who from the time of Abraham coming out, You know, Israel suffered, and you say, but they were not born yet. God saw Israel in the loins of Abraham when he said, your seed shall be a blessing to all the families of the earth. You see, when he called Abraham out at 75 years old, God took him through a whole lot of stuff. (laughs) Sometimes we got to go through a whole lot of stuff to get where we're going. And finally, it came to the highest point where God asked Abraham to 
offer his son Isaac on the altar. Thank God that he already knew that he wouldn't have to kill him. But the trial, the trial was immense. But Abraham did not, he did not cry. He did not argue with God. He simply was obedient and did what he was supposed to do. Even Isaac, he said, hey, here's the fire, dad. Here's the knife. You know, here's the wood. But where is the sacrifice? He said, the Lord will provide himself a sacrifice. Oh, wow. He already knew something. Now, think about this. Isaac gives birth to Jacob. Jacob gives birth to the 12 tribes of Israel. We know they went through a lot. And then finally they go into Egypt. And for about 215 years or so, what happens is that Israel is living in comfort in Goshen until they rose up a Pharaoh that did not know Joseph, meaning he understood who Joseph was because in Egypt you had to know all the governors, but he did not respect Joseph. He didn't give any, any respect to him. He didn't honor him. And so they put Israel, as you know, through the fire and God finally took Israel out and brought them to Mount Sinai and gave them the law. And we know the story. You've seen the movie. But listen to this. I love it. Before he, God took them out of Egypt, he had to save one man. And he took Moses out of Egypt and they put him in the desert to take care of sheep for 40 years. And then after those 40 years, he went up to the mountain because he saw a strange light. And man, when he got there, the experience that he had with God is like no other. And what's interesting is what God tells him. He tells him many things, but then it seems in the mind of Moses, why don't you listen to your people? Haven't you heard their cry? And God tells him, surely I've heard the cry, the groans of my people, and I have come down to deliver them. Wow. Folks, what's inside of you, even like Abraham? You never know what God's going to give birth to you in your life. But understand this, what you have gone through should be the story that you can tell your children that will also inspire them to have faith in God. And then they'll have to go through so that when they're going through, they remember what you told them about what you went through. And let me tell you something about that. God will inspire them to seek him, to cry out. God loves to hear the groans of people that are crying to him. Oh man, there's nothing like it. Imagine you had a child and your child is groaning because they're going through and they say, don't you hear my groans? You say, I've heard every groan. I've heard everything you've gone through. I've seen your tears. God saw it all. And Paul echoes this, for we know that the whole creation groans and travails in pain together until now. Look at this. It groans and travails in pain like a woman giving birth. They were getting ready to come out of that place. And here Paul tells us, we are going through the same thing here as New Testament believers in Christ. We're groaning. We're going through travailing. We're going through pain together all at once. But don't you know that Christ hears the groans? Don't you know that Christ hears the cry? Don't you know that he knows our pain and our sorrows? And what a day when he comes back and he takes us out of this earth. He takes us out of this world. And then the judgment comes. And after the judgment, when it's all over, he's going to get rid of this earth that we see and the heavens. And he's going to create a new one. The Bible tells us a new heavens and a new earth. And that the bride of Christ will be coming down from heaven into this new earth. That's why Jesus said, the meek shall inherit the earth. Isn't that glorious? Now let's look at verse 23. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our bodies. Now notice, Paul 
says something specific about adoption here. In Ephesians, he says, we already adopted in Christ. And also in verse 15 of the same chapter, and I'm going to read it for you right now. He says this, for as many who are led by the spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Now notice what he says next. The spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. He didn't say we're going to be, that we are the children of God. But the adoption he is talking about here, we're groaning, we're going through pains in life, but listen to this, we're the first fruit of the Spirit of God. Wow. The word used here denotes properly the first fruits of the harvest, the portion that was first collected and consecrated to God as an offering of gratitude. Oh man, look what Deuteronomy 26 two says. That you shall take of the first of all the fruit of the earth, which you shall bring of your land that the Lord your God gives you, and you shall put it in a basket, and you shall go unto the place which the Lord your God shall choose to place his name there. <laughs> oh, wow. What an exciting thing to know that we are in one basket. We are the first fruits of the Spirit. The Spirit of God did not dwell in any one person until Jesus came and died upon the cross and resurrected. And 50 days later, after his death and resurrection, after that, God poured down the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts, as you already know, to about 120 people that were waiting in the upper room. And the Spirit came upon them, went into them, went into the Spirit of who they are. And what happened is that now they were filled with the promised Holy Spirit. They understood the harvest has come and the Spirit of God was now indwelling the first fruit of the harvest. And you, my brothers and my sisters, you are the first fruit of the harvest. God gave Jesus as an offering to die for us. After his resurrection, he gives us the spirit and he offer us eternal life with Christ. Hallelujah. And so we're waiting not for the adoption to become children of God, but we are waiting for the adoption of our new bodies. <laughs> Hallelujah. I'm excited about this. We're waiting for him to come because when he comes, this sick body, and I'm not talking about sickness, although we go through sickness, it's corrupt. It is perverse. It is no good. It dies, but it's going to be transformed in the blink of an eye, faster than a blink of an eye. It's going to be an awesome transformation. Imagine You've seen movies where people transform and they take you slowly until it happens. Our transformation is going to be like that. Straight up. Everything all at once. We're going to have a new body. We're going to be a new creation in our body. And what, listen, what we've been adopted for shall be seen when the body has been changed. No more sickness. No more pain. No more travailing. No more of anything that we pass through in this earth. We're going to rest in his presence and in his glory forevermore as the first fruits. Oh, I got news for you. When he takes us to heaven, he's going to present us to the Father. Remember, in Deuteronomy, we just read, you are to present it to the Lord your God. Jesus is going to present us like a new basket of first fruit. And he's going to say, here, Father, here is the harvest. Here it is. We are finished. It is done. What was done on the cross, he says, now it is finished. Here's your children with new bodies, new life, and we're going to bow and worship him throughout all eternity. Why? Because he is the king. Even Exodus chapter 23, verse 19, the first of the first fruits 
of your land you shall bring unto the house of the Lord your God. Why? Because we belong to him. I have a father. You have a father. We have a Lord. We have the spirit. We have faith. We have hope. We have redemption. All of these things are ours. But I'm going to take you one more time to Deuteronomy 26 verse 2. At the very end, when he talks about taking the first fruit of the earth, you shall bring it of the land to the Lord your God that gives it to you. And he says, and you shall put it in a basket. (laughs) And you shall go unto the place which the Lord your God shall choose to place his name there. The moment that you came to Christ, not only were you adopted, but he put his name on you. His name is on you. It is sealed upon your forehead. You may not see it, but the angels see it. And those other spirits that are evil, they know who you are. They know that you belong to Christ. That's why they can't touch you. They can't do anything to you unless God allows it. And when he does, he says, go ahead. I subject them to that persecution to those trials and those tribulations. But know this, <laughs> the hope that is inside them. How is the hope inside of you? Because the Spirit of God is living inside of you and His name is on your forehead. His name is on you. Please keep that in mind. It's like when you walk into a place and you go to, let's say, for a job interview. What's your name? And you go, my name is so-and-so. You have to give them your last name. Why? Because it will identify you as a person belonging to somebody else who has the same name. Hallelujah. Imagine that you are in a place here in this world where you have the name of Christ on you. And that's why when we pray, we can pray in that name and partake of the influence of the Spirit of God as He prays through us and we pray with him. The spirit was sent down to attend for the preaching of the gospel, to share the hope that we have in Christ with those that God already marked. Let me tell you something. No matter how we look at it, we can understand one thing, that we have been pledged to the earnest, to the foretaste of joys that is to come. So we understand that Christ lives in us by His Spirit and we have hope. And this is the hope in 1 Corinthians 15, 20. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that sleep or that slept. Think about this now. Those who have gone to the grave are sleeping in Christ and on that day, When he comes, we who are alive shall not go before those who are sleeping. It's going to be so beautiful when Christ comes and those who have trusted in him are going to be raised from the dead. They're going to come out of their graves and we together with them shall meet him in the air. Paul said, thus we shall be with the Lord forever. God will not remove his name from off of you. You are his child. You have been adopted by Christ, his blood, the spirit. You have been sealed until the day of redemption. This is your hope while we wait in this troubled world. God bless you. Have a wonderful spirit-filled adopted day. (laughs) Rejoice. Party about your adoption today. And until we meet again, shalom.